when I used to, uh, I used, so I grew up and I always grew up like uncomfortable with the person that I was portraying and the person that I felt that I was, like I always thought I was, um, I grew up very overweight pretty much my entire life, actually my entire life. I grew up, um, so I think by my junior, so I went into freshman year, like 210 pounds, 220, and I was super, like, I was not, like, I was not that tall. I was, like, five foot nine. I was, like, 210. I was, like, 220. And I think all children... They always try to find a path. Like, they try to find a group of people that they can feel super comfortable with. And it's something that you never grow out of. And, like, you're always told the older you get, the less and less group mentality really means. Like, like in high school, I mean, we all know, like, even high school, college, whatever it is, <clears throat> there is a certain number of groups of the population, whether it be the athletes, whether it be the um, emo or goth, whether it be the pretty girls or the cheerleaders or whatever, like the sluts, the guy sluts, the girl sluts, whatever it possibly is, the class clown. And throughout middle school and elementary school and high school, most of high school, I was super overweight. Like I was very obese and for me, food was the option that I chose. So I think all kids, no matter what your circumstance is, there's always something that throws you off a little bit, that makes you feel uncomfortable. And kids' brains are always triggered at the most abnormal times, like times that you don't even realize. <clears throat> and I know for me, I distinctly remember always, like food was my comfort zone it was the place that because I grew up with having a sense of almost isolation but not not so much isolation but not fully understanding what it meant to have like a group and what it meant to have like friends so that my entire life I was always bouncing around from different um parts of different different um sex of my age group you know, I was always I was always playing some sport, whether it been baseball, um, basketball, and I I never so it was interesting because I always get the question like I always had the question which I'm sure a lot of people have when you are a bigger kid, and I don't know what the equivalent would be for girls, but I would love to hear what it would be. But the equivalent you get or like for guys if you're a bigger kid, and it's always funny that we're big and fat. They have pretty much similar meanings um but fat is so much more of an aggressive term and big was always the word that i heard i always heard i was big big boy big mike um big kid uh big boned and then so i never really looked at myself as anything that was negative and i was always told i should play football and people always wanted me to play football but I remember being so young. I was like seven, eight, nine, ten years old, and I played for one practice. And literally the one and the one practice. So I begged and begged and begged my mom to play football. And I started relatively late. I think I was like ten years old, which you know that's actually not too late. But kids nowadays start at like six years old. I mean they're starting football so young. I think that's slowly fading away when people are finally realizing about like CTE and whatnot. But I remember just begging my mom to just let me play football and then she finally gave in and I started playing football and just at that age these kids were already so much more advanced than I was I was bigger so just by like pure grab or by pure like physics it was harder to hurt me but I remember just watching kids get hit like so we there's this drill that people do in football where you basically so essentially 
I think what you're trying to test is the quickness, the ability to get up and get ready to get hit. And obviously, if you don't get up in time, you're going to get rocked. <laughs> you're going to get crushed, um, especially if you're a tinier kid. And, you know, they would try to put uh, even, you know, even boys up against even boys. So you wouldn't die if you hit a kid who was, you know, in my case, I was probably buck sixty, buck fifty, And for being 10 years old, it's pretty heavy. I mean, probably not that heavy, but I was pretty heavy. Um, and so you basically, you lay down your back, your heads are facing each other on your back. I would say there's about eight, six to eight feet between the end of your head and the other person's head, which is directly behind you, but you lay down your back, um, in the anatomy position. So your hands are forward face, your palms are facing the sky and you got to wait for the whistle of the coach and you can't see the coach. You, You don't see the coach. When they blow the whistle, you get up, you turn around, and you literally just, so you're like this. So here you go. I'm on my back. Let's go this way. You, you're on your back, looking up in the sky. You Once you hear the whistle, so three, two, the whistle goes off. You get up, get to your feet, turn around, and you're just hitting each other. You just run into each other. It's like boom, boom. And you do this, and you keep doing this, and you see who wins. It was like tournament style. And it was, and I remember just sitting there watching it because I had a, I had a mouthpiece that I could, I just could not get into my mouth. I remember having that issue, like not being able to put the mouthpiece into my mouth. And the other issue I had is we would have to wear a jock strap, obviously to protect yourself. And I didn't understand what a jock strap was. And I, I knew what it was. I knew, but at this age, I didn't know the importance of having testicles and like what it meant to like really protect them. And I didn't ask. And the answer, and I grew up in a, Catholic faith so the answer was to you know it wasn't anything about having a kid because you can't say that because God Jesus gives you a kid so I didn't understand the purpose of having whatever it was at 10 years old you don't even know like you don't (laughs) you don't even have a name for it so I remember literally just I would sit on the sidelines if I had to pee I would just pee into the jock strap I swear to God you get You can ask anybody. You can ask my parents. I would just pee in the jock strap. It was just, I would just pee in it. I didn't care. Like I would pee in the pools. I would pee in the ocean. I just, I didn't care. Like I, st- like I, 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 the idea of water coming out of my body didn't seem so like, like it didn't seem gross to me. Um, nowadays it does feel gross to me. Um, obviously, because I know it's pee. Uh, but at the time, I had no idea. <clears throat> and I remember just sitting there, you know, moving around my jock strap because it was peeing in. I'd want to get it off my legs so I wasn't cold. I remember just trying to get this mouthpiece in my mouth. I remember the coaches coming over and, like, squirting water between our face masks. And I, I was just watching these kids just smash each other. And it was like a competition style. It was like tournament style. And, yeah, you were learning some things, but you weren't really learning. It was more or less just like a competition of breaking – young boys brains like that's what it was to me I didn't understand it. it didn't because it wasn't like like when you practice you should practice skills and that's a skill I get it I understood but I was like I don't even really know how to catch a football I don't really know how to throw a football and these coaches I was playing with they were like already having these kids like play certain positions like at that young of an age you should be playing everything but like so if you're so, but at this practice, it was like if you're running back, you're practicing running drills. If you're a quarterback, blah 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 blah. And at ten years old, dude, you're you're, you're freaking growing. Like nobody knows what your size is gonna end up being. Like, <clears throat> anyways, I remember just sitting there watching this, and I was so uncomfortable, and I didn't like it. I didn't like the fact that I was getting my head just hit all the time and just hurting myself. And I <laughs> I didn't understand why. You know, I didn't understand why, and that's when I kind of started understanding that my confusion on the world is not going to be taken out through an aggressive manner so then i i stopped playing football which a football is a sport where if you are heavy you are overweight you are fat you can get by because there's different positions you can play where having weight is an advantage especially if you're overweight you're fat you're obese and you have the ability to be athletic too so then i stopped playing football which was perfectly fine with me another reason we stopped playing is because my bedtime was at 8.30, and practice was getting out at 8.30. So my mom took me out of football. And after, after I think I went to like six or seven practices, 
and I didn't even play a game. Like I, ne- I've never played a game of football in my life, and that's verbally. I don't think I've ever said that like to myself or to you guys or to anybody. I've always just played practice. I always just did practice, but that was so aggressive to me, and I didn't like it. I still, when I watch like college sports now, like especially college sports, like being on different campuses, whether it be the school I go to, Towson University, or whether it be even just like going to community college and seeing people who play sports there, or like going to Virginia Tech, which is like a D1 school with incredible, you know, sports programs. People like Michael Vick have come from there, like incredible athletes. Knowing that they're my age right now, I'm watching these people play a sport and not getting paid for it. It was just so absurd. Like, I mean, think think about that. You're going to a school, and you know, there's different viewpoints on this, but you're going to school on a scholarship to play football. Okay, I get it. The school's paying you to come to this school, right? They're paying for your education. That's fine. I get it. But how naive do we have to be to understand that? You are paying for them to come to school, but the kid is going there for a degree, but especially at D1, how much there is, you're not going to talk, especially in football, anything, you're not going to talk to any of these kids, and they're not going to tell you that they're not thinking about moving on to the pros. I would say 85 to 90% of them all want to go to the pros. So are you, it's almost like as a college, like taking advantage of these kids and their education, especially in a contact sport, you're paying them to go to your school and whatever degree they're going for, business, um, medicine, uh, law school, whatever it could possibly be, it's like they're you're paying them to make you money, right? Because that's what you're doing. You're getting the best player, so you have the best program, so you can put out the best team. What is what do what do what do sports teams do for you? Especially D one and anything D one. You get sponsorships, school gets sponsorships, school gets paid, the school gets airtime, the school gets this and that and this and so many different streams of revenue come in and it's like i'm gonna pay for him or her to go to school i'm gonna tell them that this is what you're gonna get you're gonna get a free education i'm gonna give you a full ride scholarship but you're gonna and that's gonna allow you to play the sport that you love cool i get it i understand but it's almost like there is a serious advantage there's you're seriously playing one over on people and you can say what you want about it but Let's say I go D1, you're paying for my school, you're paying $50,000 a year for me to go play football. So I'm getting an education that now I don't pay for, so I probably don't value it nearly as much. I'm going to go out there and get my head just bashed in. Long-term effects of head injury are pretty likely for me to get, but at least I have an education. I have an education now. I'm Now I have an education, so just in case football doesn't work out, but guess what? I don't have the same cognition that I had before. And impulsivity is a real thing, especially for men. They're impulsive. It's really hard to think, especially a sport like that. Like, there's certain things in life where you just go and they give you such an adrenaline rush that you just can't ever leave. You see it a lot with athletes. You see it a lot if you just go to a bar. You see you see people at the bar talking about, like, the high school football days. It's such an adrenaline rush. You're on top of the world. Everything around you is just going together so well for you. And it's like you can take advantage of that from people. You can play with these with, with people's emotions. And it's not like I don't think I don't think all the schools are doing it on purpose. I mean, they definitely are up to a point. I mean, there's schools all the time getting in trouble for, you know, scamming. Not, not scamming, but, like, buying these kids, like, strippers. That happened at, uh, I think, Louisville. Like buying these kids strippers when they come in with their parents who look at the school. Hey, you're going to spend a week here up in this uh, this apartment and you guys are going to experience the college life. And then, boom, two days into it, there's professional strippers coming in. What the fuck? 17, 18, 19 year old kids. Like, you're not paying them directly, but you're definitely swaying them, right? Especially if you're a heterosexual man. You know, like, of course. And. And, you know, sometimes they, they buy them jewelry. They, they buy, they guarantee things. They give money to these kids. And it's, and it would be hard to implement something where you pay these kids, but you're an adult. There's not many things you do after 18 where you trade time with nothing in return. There's not many things at all. Football, the odds of return, the risk are really high with the possibility of never being able to make money in it. 
and the possibility to lose your freaking brain. Like your brain is going to break. And there's no dollar sign you can put on that. There's no dollar sign you can put on having a functioning brain. I mean, I don't, I have a functioning brain right now, I think, up to the point that I know. Um, but you see grandparents all the time, like, damn, what do you regret? Oh, man. You know, I wish I took it easier on my hip. I can't walk now. I can't, like, you know, hang out with my grandkids. Like, that sucks, man. And it's like your brain, well, it, 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 the long term effects are so blurry to people who are in these high states of emotions. Anyways, that was a, that's a sidetrack. I think I sidetracked, but that's how I thought. Literally, at this age of ten years old, I was sitting there. I was like, I don't want to do this. I'm putting a helmet on so I can hit another person harder. No. So that led me to stop playing football. I was like, I'm not playing football. This is stupid. <laughs> I like my face, and so I started playing sports that. Because remember, I'm, I'm overweight at this time, so I started playing sports that, uh, the weight was impacted you more, but I enjoyed more and my school level was higher. So I started playing sports like uh, baseball and basketball. And these are, once I got into this world, because there's something about like very macho sports where it's like being a certain size is, it's not like, it's not like praise, but it's like, Oh, you're a big boy. Like you're, you know, like it's a good thing. Now it's not a good, that's not what I'm trying to say, but there's no negative, um, anything negative about it, which I think that's, there shouldn't be anything negative about it. But in baseball and uh, basketball, the two sports I was playing, you noticed if you were overweight. I mean, you hit a baseball and you should be able to beat the throw out. You can't run there fast enough, right? And you, and you can say, oh, well, you're a home run hitter. Okay, you're only a home run hitter when you're getting paid to be one, right? Am, am I wrong for that? Just because you're a home run hitter in college usually doesn't mean you get a first round draft pick. You gotta have average, just more things in baseball, Like, there's more, I mean, in both sports, but being super overweight has a lot more cons in baseball than it does in, uh, like, like football or rugby or a sport, it's a contact sport, and even, like, wrestling and, you know, um, whatever, because there's there's classes for that. There's not a class for that for baseball. So this is when I started noticing... Like throughout like my middle school days and early high school, I was a good baseball player. I you know kept up with some of the better players, but then got to a point where my weight just. This is when I first started noticing my weight issue. Like middle school, seventh, eighth grade, and I, I remember just hearing chatter about. I would hear like little conversations between my parents or, you know, wherever I went to have dinner. Like, oh my God, is he? You know, like, you know, should we switch up the food for him? You know, he's eating everything. I would. I remember many times, my we would go to like a buffet, or I remember we went to the cruise ship one time, and I just kept on eating because remember I didn't understand that there was anything wrong with being overweight because at this time, once I once again Catholic is where I grew up, and you know it's like this is the body God gave you. You're beautiful the way you are, and I understand, I get it, but if I could have lived my entire life just being completely naive. And understanding that, then I wouldn't have been sad. But the truth of the matter is, one day, I figured out, fuck, this sucks. And this is the point I'm trying to get at. So I couldn't run as fast as people. I couldn't, I couldn't hit the ball as far. You know, I couldn't, you know, stay in the game as long. I couldn't pitch as fast. I couldn't, you know, this is why I wasn't as quick. And I started, and then I remember going on a cruise, and I would... Keep on eating at the buffet, and my dad was like, third, third plate, Mike? I was like, yep. He was like, okay. And it was just starting to becoming prevalent. Like, I'm not a kid anymore. Like, you're 14, you're 15, 16. You're, I mean, you're still a kid, but at that point, that's when the groups start coming together, man. That's when people start – that's when kids just start being super aggressive to each other. And I I, I remember this so well. I, I literally – I started getting so angry about my weight. But I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know because I was in, I was kind of embarrassed. Like my sister, she wasn't overweight. My mom, my dad at the time were in really good shape, still are in good shape, you know, and they were all in good shape, but I wasn't. And I, you know, I was told that, you know, you have a slow metabolism. Okay, that's fine. But didn't do anything to help my metabolism. <laughs> um, you know, you're big boned. I heard that one. And 
I went to the doctors and BMI would come back and I convinced myself that BMI was completely wrong. And, you know, yes, BMI does have issues like in the sense that if you're really, really short, but you have uh, just a thicker, literally a thicker bone structure structure, and you're more of a, uh, I think, mesomorph and you're just a, like a more a northern Scandinavian looking man, man, you might be obese or overweight, but you're actually relatively healthy compared to like your organs ability to keep up with your f- daily functioning needs and your daily activities. Um, but I, it's when I started noticing people around me, like, and then certain groups started happening. Like I noticed that me being overweight did not, um, allow for me to be, I wasn't attracted by the opposite sex and I wasn't attracted by the same sex in the sense that people just didn't want to be friends with me. And the people that did want to be friends with me, I think a lot of it was almost like a circus act. And this is, and once again, this is just me talking. This is why I want to have guests on so I can talk to them. It's almost like a circus act. Like, act. like, like I remember eating and, and people would like watch me eat. And I, instead of getting a- upset, I would just take it as like a class clown would. I would just start eating more. And I would think it's funny. And I would be the class clown. I was always joking about myself. Like if you can, if you can make the harshest joke about yourself before anybody else can, then you're above. You, you you win. You win because no one else can make fun of you. And that was my mind state. That was my mindset. And that's when I started realizing it. Like when people started saying things and I started feeling it. When I couldn't walk up the steps, I was breathing too heavy. When I was rolling around in my bed and like I could feel my stomach moving. Like literally from everything I drank the night before, liquid and food and Chinese food. And I remember just feeling greasy and nasty and low energy and I remember I would binge eat. That was my thing. I was always coming home and just eating like literally six, seven, eight honey buns followed by more chips because this is how I dealt with it's such an evil cycle. You know, this is why you can understand an alcoholic or a drug addict or somebody who just is addicted to sex. There's so many different things. It's like an evil cycle because you, it's a, it's gratification. It's It satisfies your craving. It does 100% satisfy your craving but then it makes you feel worse than it made you feel good. So it's a cycle that you can never catch up. You're never going to catch up to it. You're going to constantly be running on a hamster wheel. And this is where I was. I felt like shit. So I would eat like shit. And then I felt like shit because I ate like shit. Then I would eat like shit again. And I just kept on going, kept on going. And then um, I remember one year, one time I, I was – just doing research, my dad was doing uh, something called the ketogenic diet or the Atkins diet. Um, he was doing the Atkins diet. My personality is, oh, let's look at this. Let's see what this is about. And this is this is this is my big thing about like the ketogenic diet and like the Atkins diet. It's very much um, there's a lot of controversy around it. But at the end of the day, if you restrict something from a diet, boom, you take it away, you're gonna lose. Your body is gonna change the way it looks. That's just the truth. If you eat less, no matter how you do it, if you restrict your calories, no matter which way you do it, you're going to lose weight. Now, that's when it becomes an issue. Are you losing positive weight, good weight? What what type of weight are you losing? Water weight? What are you doing? Are you eating less salt? Are you losing muscle mass? Are you becoming skinny fat? What's happening? But at that time, it didn't matter. Like To me, I've always been a person of extreme. So you're fat or skinny. Fat or skinny. That, that's it. And I still feel like that now. When I feel like literally I have to wake up, and sometimes I feel skinny or I feel fat. I never just feel okay. And that's something that I finally started learning by going to therapy and talking to my girlfriend. Is sometimes, like if you're someone like that who is just doesn't live in a comfortable situation ever, not because it's not comfortable, because being comfortable is scary because it means like stagnation, like you're not moving, there's no progress, and that that scares the shit out of me, and that's different than just feeling content, C- content is good, if you feel good about everything about your life, and you feel like things are going well, but you're still progressing, that's good, but not me, it's like if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards, and that's how it was with my weight, so I remember just, you are not happy, I would wear the same clothes, I remember I bought these shoes off a of Nike ID, and I just bought these shoes, and they had my name on it, Mike. I started calling myself Mike because I, I didn't want to identify as Michael. I was Mike because Mike you can make a lot more jokes with. You know, as people call you Big Mike, you know, Mike just has a more 
I guess like a more fat name, but not it's you know not really. It's not a more fat name, but it sounds like like if you say Mike to yourself, you sound like you feel like you're talking to or you're listening to a bigger person than Michael. It, that's in my head, so you probably don't feel that way at all. But um, that's how I felt. So I started identifying as such a bigger kid, bigger kid. But I have, I also am the person that I will change when I'm fully aware of it, and I push myself to the, to like the worst possible outcome, and then I make a change, which is like good in the fact that you make a change, but it's really bad because you do push yourself to a place where you can't break. And I just got fed up, you know, I got fed up of just being tired and I got fed up with just not having the opposite sex be attracted to me and not being and not being uh, comfortable with, you know, having muscle mass. I hated that. I hated having to make excuses every day on why I was overweight. I hated seeing people that I didn't think were deserving of what they were getting, but I correlated with them being skinny. And during this whole time, everything was skinny to me, skinny and fat, skinny and fat. So I remember sophomore year, um, I get out of last day of school. I literally get out of school. I gotta spell this word. And I get out of school, and I'm like, "Damn, dude, I'm not, I'm not coming back junior year, looking, fucking overweight." So I start talking to my dad and. He's, I, I see like in the fridge, like keto diet, the keto diet, and or Akin bar, Akin bar. So I look it up, and it's like the idea of it is lower carbohydrates, um, but not eliminating carbs, but having a higher income of having more fiber in your body than just carbs. So having a, basically a higher fibers diet. So it's a low net carb diet, and net carbs are just carbs. Minus fiber. So if you have something, let's hypothetically eat something with 100 carbs, but it has 10 fiber, then it's only 90 net carbs. 20 carbs, 5 net fi- 20 carbs, 5 grams of fiber, 20 grams of carbs, 15 net carbs. So it was like a certain point that you got to stay under. And the more research I did, I was like, ah, that's kind of like level one. I want to get like to the hardest level. So I look up keto diet. And keto diet is essentially, it was like a... 10% carbs, and then you fill in the rest. I prefer, it's more or less like a, I, I went like on a, like, I was eating a really high fat diet. I was like 60% fat, probably 30% protein, and then like 10% carbs. And then I even got lower. And this, I just started losing weight like crazy, crazy. And this was probably, the looking back at it now after years of it going by, I mean, I was 16 years old, I think. I'm now 22. And now looking at it, it almost was like the worst decision I made, but it helped me a lot in the sense that I learned a lot from it. But I went from just being big and overweight and fat. I think the biggest I got up to was probably 235, 240, around that sophomore year, about six feet tall, five foot, probably five foot 10 to six feet. And I was a big boy. And I came back... That following school year, four months later, I had like 170. So I lost around 65 pounds. And later in the school year, so about a month after being back at school, so around my birthday, I dipped down even lower. This is when it got a little dark for me. So it was like mid-August to about September 20th, around mid-September. About a month, I was just super sick. Like I was, I started with keto, which was fine. But then something happened where I just literally just stopped eating. I was eating 200 calories a day, if that. I was just drinking water and water. I actually went to the dentist when I got my wisdom teeth removed. I went to the dentist, and I sit down in the seat, and this was the day I was getting my teeth removed. And the dentist looks at me. Or no, it was like the checkup, and then I was getting it removed. He looks at my mouth, and he can see that there's just no bacteria in my mouth. He's literally looking at my mouth. There's no bacteria. And he's like, how much water are you drinking? I'm like, uh, three to four gallons. He, he's like, you, you can't do that. You're literally flushing all the cal, like everything, all the bacteria, and not not bacteria, but like all the good bacteria and bad bacteria. Everything in my mouth is just gone. <laughs> like that's how much water I was drinking, and I wasn't eating. I was eating probably 500 calories max a day. 
But even when I was eating those calories, I was eating it in a quiet area by myself and nobody was watching. And then I was started becoming, I have started making myself sick. I would start throwing up. I would start making myself throw up. And to this day, I still gag every once in a while. It's a weird thing. I don't know if I want to tell you guys about it, but I would throw up my food. Um, so I, I, I would th- vomit forcefully. But I also did, sometimes I would eat like chips or something. And I would ha- have the taste. I would chew it, chew it all up. And then I would spit it out. So I get the taste and just the crunch of it. And I would spit it right out. And that was probably the hardest part of the diet. Um, so right around my birthday, September 9th, I came down with the flu. Obviously, I have no immune system at the time. I'm sick, no energy, not doing anything for myself, very much in a depressive state. Um, I went from being super overweight to super underweight. But this is when it really got weird for me. This is when I this this was part of my childhood where I really started developing a negative out view on everybody, which is something just recently I finally got a hold of and I finally understood because when I came back everybody like everybody started noticing me again. It was so weird because it was just the way I looked. That's all it was, right? That's all it possibly was. Now, was it? It could have been I was carrying myself different uh, because I felt more confident. I was holding my head higher. My shoulders were farther back. I felt like I did something, and people could notice that. But was it was it everything? I don't know. You know, I didn't know at the time. I didn't understand. So I started just thinking everybody was so shallow, especially girls, especially guys. I mean, guys, <laughs> you know, guys too. And I just thought everyone was super shallow. Just checking if my volume still on. That would really make me mad if it wasn't. <coughs> yeah, and I just I started thinking people were just super shallow because you. I'm the same person. I'm just lighter. Just lighter. And I'm also not doing well either. Like, I'm not doing well at all. I'm not sleeping at night. I'm cold all the time. I'm just not doing well. I became, you know, very anorexic. I remember literally looking at myself... <laughs> Like in mirrors all the time, pulling up my shirt and just like grabbing like pieces of um, like skin, like pieces of my body and just looking at it like, dude, Mike, you're fucking, you're still fat. What the fuck are you doing? And then I just wouldn't eat again. And I wasn't working out like in the, in the gym. I still didn't have a gym membership. I was just doing cardio and cardio and cardio. I just, I was doing cardio all the time. Just cardio. Like in my basement, I'd go out and run like 10 miles. And then I came back and everybody was treating me different. So then I started looking at people just in a bad manner. I didn't, I had friendships, but I just didn't trust anybody. So everyone I did know, I just didn't trust anything about them. I, it was very, uh, it was, it was hard in the sense that it really distanced me from people. So it actually, and I wasn't aware that a lot of it was on me. So it was actually, once again, reinforcing my belief, my hypothesis that all people suck. Because if you have no friends and you, in your head, you think it's because of, because, and you're valid, and it's, you have no friends, and by the act of you having no friends is validating whatever absurd, absurd thought you have in your head, it doesn't matter because it's validating it. So you're correct. So I thought I was right. I thought I was right. So I just didn't really have a lot of friends. I didn't really know what to talk to, but a lot of people wanted to be my friends and that upset me more because I didn't change. Like you're shallow, you're a shallow person. Um, and then, you know, around September 9th, I just, or, you know, around the beginning of the school year, I just kept losing weight and I got the flu and I got sick and I got like to 155. That was the lightest I've ever been. And I have a video I can pull it. I, I, can, I don't think I showed on the podcast, but if you go on one of my YouTube channels, I think if you go on this, I mean, if you're watching this on YouTube, just Look up um, my weight loss transformation. I think there's two videos. I forget which one has the posing of me in a gym locker room. At this point, I was like 180. So I was about 20 pounds heavier. Um, but I'm about like 190 right now. But I'm in a lot more comfortable shape right now. Like I can binge. I, not binge. I don't binge anymore really. But I can eat a lot. Put on six, seven pounds. You know, just water weight. And I understand what weight is. The more the more reading I do, I understand that I have control and I feel in control of it now. So I'm not worried about it now, but 
that's a new thing that's within the past six months. Like every year I would just put on 70 pounds, lose 70 pounds, put on 70 pounds, lose 70 pounds. And once again, people would be like, oh my God, he lost so much weight. So it validated again. That's it's so fucking evil. The cycle so evil because it just keeps validating your inaccurate and absurd wrong thoughts. Like, so it's just, they caught up in the cycle. Anyways, so I just got super sick. I got super sick and I became very insular and I became very much like, um, push people away from me. I didn't want anybody near me. Um, and then people I did have near me, I was, you know, very controlling of them because if I have the control, then I never let you have control. Then you can't harm me. Right. That's, that's how you're thinking at the time. Um, yeah. So that, that's kind of like my, my history with like my body and the, and that's, you know, if you guys know me personally, and if you guys don't know me personally, I hope that helped you a little bit because it's so, it really is, it really is super important for you to, because we all have something, there's always something within all of us that can um, alter the way we view ourselves. And there's always something that someone says that we pick up and, you know, the person said it, but it didn't have too much meaning behind it to them. But I know to me, it did It did have a lot of meaning. Like this weight had a lot of meaning to me. And that's why I'm a big advocate of, you know, I understand like fat shaming. I know what fat shaming is. I know it's probably not the best thing for a lot of people. But at the same time, for me, it's like, I don't know. You know, I get it. I understand you shouldn't fat shame people. You shouldn't make fun of people. But man, like, I think if I was fat shamed, I wouldn't have to do it to myself. I would have been pissed off at the other people. But when I lost weight, I would have been like, damn, they're right. You know, they're right. You know, instead of me just shaming myself. And that's why I I come off, you know, sometimes come off a bit aggressive. But when people tell me that, you know, they're so happy with the weight, it's like, I, it's really hard for me to accept that. Because from my experience, it's really hard to do that because... That weight, the weight isn't just physical pounds. It's you. It's the lack of control. You know, it's the lack of control that you have on yourself, and that that can depress the fuck out of you because you think you. I mean, you're told you should have all this control, but if you can't even keep your diet in check, it's like, dude, what the fuck? What do you have control over? Um. Yeah, and then and then you know, my senior year came along, and uh, this is the why I started going to the gym. Actually, back in high school, there was this uh, weight, 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 weight instructor teacher. It was a weight training class. It took a sophomore year, junior, junior year, and dude, that that professor, I call him a professor. He was a teacher. He was a PE teacher, gym teacher. But dude, he was so. I'm just gonna say, Mr. K. I'm not gonna say his last name. But if he hears this podcast, I hopefully he does. But I don't think he would. I don't know how he would unless you guys share it with him or someone watching this goes to the high school. Um, but he changed my life, literally changed my life. And I, we all know people like that. Like I remember he was big into CrossFit, so we would always do CrossFit classes. And so it was so good. And I started learning like more than just cardio, build muscle. So I started learning how to build muscle, which – allowed me to challenge myself instead of just let me run it you could just run all day and obviously i'm not a competitive runner but for me in my head you just run that's all you do there's no tech i mean there's technique i know this technique but to me you just freaking run that's all you do and like <clears throat> i know that's not true but when i started figuring out oh wait i have full control over my body are you telling me i can just build muscle if i want to and he owned his own crossfit gym which was so cool to me because at this time i'm like selling things to make an income whatever whatever i could i was selling whatever pencils it didn't matter what it was dorito chips what whatever it was i was flipping things i was selling things so the fact that he was literally going to school to be a PE teacher and then he was also owning his own crossfit you tell me you work you do work out for a living that's one of your jobs not even a job you own it like that was so amazing to me and that was like a role model of mine and he told me what like hard work was. And I used to get so excited just going there and fuck around and just have a good time. And then uh, senior year came around and I went to prom. And at prom breakfast, there was like a giveaway. And so I put my name in. I never I never did giveaways. My dad used to always tell me that like uh, 
you know, like he would never win them. So that you know, obviously I'm like, oh, well, if my dad doesn't, then I won't either. So I just never play giveaways. <clears throat> Boom. What happens? I get a free three months at a gym. That was awesome. Started doing that. And the one thing led to another. Now I work at a gym and I've been to six different gyms. I have three memberships right now. And it's a big part of my life. Um, obviously, it's a big part of my life. It's changed me. If you know anything about me, it's. I think I've helped a lot of people too with it because it's so empowering. That's the thing. That's the thing about working out is so empowering. And it's like, it, it gets a bad rap, especially like anybody who like does a type of bodybuilding. And it, it's frustrating to me because I know it's, help me so much and it helps so so if you if you're someone who suffers from anxiety if you're someone who suffers from panic attacks suffer from anything that you feel like you don't have control of even if like obsessive compulsive disorder you have so much control over one thing but then everything else is going haywire you don't have control because you only have control of one thing so everything else is going crazy um it's like putting all your eggs in one basket you should spread them out but you can't because this thing has so much control over you which means you have no control. And I've explained it three times. I need to move on. <laughs> There's something amazing about stepping into a weight room, seeing these weights, basic math. I can't put on 135 pounds. I'll get underneath the bar. I'll go down my chest. I press it up. I can't get it up. I can't get it up. I cannot get it up. There's nothing I can do, take, cheat, or whatever. As long as my form's good, there's nothing I can do right there on the spot to push it up. That right there for someone like me and for I think a lot of people is so fucking humbling. It really is. It's so humbling because you can't lie. You can't cheat. You can't make up a story. You know, I, I would lie sometimes, sometimes a lot as a child, honestly, like, but I didn't even know I was lying. I just was so embarrassed. And that weight room, man, it was just a magic, dude. And I was never embarrassed. Like, I just walked in there and started lifting. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. But I just didn't, I didn't feel embarrassment because I was just so damn excited because I knew, you know, because of that gentleman, Mr. K, who helped me. He didn't help me, not not directly, but watching him just have this passion and seeing his arms. I remember watching his arms was so jacked and his calves are so big and I was like, dude, he did this. Like, he kept his hair cut nice. He had a nice beard, and he just was so happy all the time, so aggressive, and he just didn't do negativity. Like, if somebody was negative in his class, if someone was kept on talking, he, if he said, hey, if you talk one more time, I'm going to kick you out. They talk one more time, he was out. He just felt like he had control of his emotions. And we were in a weight room, and it, we could have been, whatever, in a garden. I would have related it back to the garden, but we just happened to be in a weight room. So I related it to the weight room. And then for me, that's how it became. Like, I just started thinking that, and it is, that you have, something about the weight room just is so, you have so much control in there. You can, and it's not just control, but it allows, it teaches you that things take time. Like, I can, I was able, not, <laughs> I've lost a good amount of weight, and I'm at a healthy weight now. Like I said, like, between 185 to 195, depending on whatever day it is, how much water I have the night before. How much food I eat if I don't exercise for a few days. That's another thing. I can go like seven days now without exercising. I'm totally fine with it. Well, like weightlifting. But I can I would do other things. But that's what I think the gym is the coolest thing because there's so many positive benefits. You know, first off, excess energy, man. That excess energy. Everybody I feel like everybody has when they wake up, you know, they have a battery that's just overflowing naturally. And some people just take self pity out of them. That's how they get rid of it. They just self-inflect pain on themselves, whatever, whatever it is, you know, waking up, cutting themselves. Some people do that. Some people eat, some people drink, some people smoke, some people just do too many good things for people. And that results in a lack of self, um, self fulfillance, which is a, a form of self hatred. you know, if they're too humble, then they never feel like the world wants to hear them. Then they start blaming the world, even though it's them, because they don't feel like anything they say is valuable. So it's like the weight room just gets rid of the energy. Boom, off the bat. You can do it in the morning, whenever. As long as you get rid of the energy, I prefer early in the morning. It's gone. You're at a base level now. So everything you're going into that day, you just have a better head on your shoulders. You know, you're thinking better. You're just you're paying attention more. You are you're when someone says something that you may not like, you're not like attacking them like a snake. You're not just like popping off all the time. <laughs> You're not. You're less impulsive because you've you've pushed your body 
hard. You got to work out hard to feel that. And you're just, like I say, you're at a calmer state. You're, you sleep better. You know, you eat better because it's really, it's really, um, if you do it, if, I mean, you can do it, but after you do it, you know, 10, 20 times, you eat like shit after a good workout, you feel like shit because you wasted your workout and you're not going to waste your workout because you're paying for a membership. <laughs> so it forces you to eat better. You sleep better because when you're tired, you fall asleep in a natural sleep cycle. So everything, it's just a compound effect and there's no reason why you shouldn't, there's no physical reason why you shouldn't be at least working out a little bit. But I found the weight room and it, it brought everything that I just had no control over about myself. And this is the important part. Not about, about everybody else. I still feel like I, you know, I got them right. I knew them. I knew these people because I knew what everybody was. They didn't like me. They just wanted to talk to me now because I look better. And that's so egotistical. And I get it. That's so narcissistic. And I understand I'm just sharing for you guys my truth, and that's why I do this podcast. And, you know, it, I could set up, like, a weight training program. So I started just really feel like it was me. I had control, and then I started putting on weight again. You know, I, I fluctuated a few times, but, you know, like four or five years later, I finally am at a point where I feel like I have control of my weight. And I think the gym is so damn important. And, you know, you, you hear a lot of people, you know, some of the most common reasons I, you know, why people don't go to the gym, you know, don't have time. It's like, oh, uh, you don't have time to live longer? What do you mean? You're not going to take care of yourself? You don't have time for your kids? Because if you're not taking care of yourself, your kids are not going to have, your grandkids are not going to have grandparents. You know, what are you doing? Make, you know, make Make t- make time. Having issues with your significant other? Don't sit there and try to fix it. Talking to them all night. Go out there. Kick your ass in the gym. Come back. Calm her mind. Let's talk it out. Let's talk it out. Gives you time to release your impulsive thoughts. Gets rid of that anger, that aggression at the gym, man. I, I'm telling you, it works. You know, and it's like an excuse. I don't have enough time. Another excuse. It's intimidating. I get it. That one I understand. That one I totally understand. I hate when I go to a gym and there's just meatheads. But, in, you know, the crazy thing is most of the times they're not even meatheads. They're usually just really strong, big-looking people. But I totally understand it. And that one is something that I think if you talk to anybody who goes in the gym, they'll help you. And the first thing you got to remember is when you go to the gym, people, I would say 90% of the people aren't paying attention to you. Like 90 to 95% of the people, they see you, they might think something. They might think, oh, wow, she's overweight or, wow, he's overweight or, wow, he's really skinny or, wow, look, he's jacked. But they're at the gym for themselves. They're not, most people are not wasting their time obsessing over your physical appearance. But that one I do understand. That one can be hard. It's a hard barrier to get over. I got lucky because I just didn't give a fuck. Because I just knew, like the same way I knew that, Slam your head in another 10 year old's head is just not good for your head. <laughs> and I'm going to have my head till the day I die. So it's got to impact me in the future, right? It's common sense. It was just math to me. And then the other one was like, all these people in here have been lifting longer than me. No wonder they look bigger than me, <laughs> better than me. But I, that one is something you can contact a friend and somebody can help you. You know, Everyone knows somebody who goes to the gym. So time... And this isn't just gym, this is fitness, this is just walking, this is just doing something on your feet besides sitting and eating and doing nothing. Um, you know, don't have enough time, don't have family support, don't have fams, you know, fam, don't have friend support. That's one that you can change immediately. Get rid of those f- friends because they're not, f- you know, they're not friends because you wouldn't have somebody, if it was a true friend, they would support you. So those that one is like one of the ones that is so obvious, but it's not obvious until you realize how fucking obvious it is. Yeah, get rid of those friends. The family one's an issue. That one, that one's hard. That one's really hard because it's a sensitive topic. I've had a. I mean, I remember dropping out of school and having a conversation with them. I felt that they were more embarrassed than I felt embarrassed for myself because I didn't feel embarrassment to me it was just black and white I wasn't ready for school at the time 
And that didn't mean I was never going to be ready for school. That means at the time I was not ready for school. I had an unfulfilled passion of mine starting a business that I had to freaking get after. I didn't want to waste anyone's money for nothing. I wasn't going to do well. I made up my mind I wasn't going to do well. Um, that's an example. But when your family doesn't, not that, they, I mean, they don't support you. They don't, I've, you know, some parents just didn't, they're like, oh, you don't want to look like one of those people. Those people think they're hot shit, whatever. Blah, 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 blah. They think they're better than anybody else. It's like, that's not true. It's not true at all. If anything, I want to help more people. That's hence personal trainer. Hence, it's why I want to do that as a career. I want to train people. Like, I want to help people. That's all I want to do. And I get satisfaction out of that. It's very, almost, it's almost selfish. Because I, the, the way I feel when I can see someone change, it doesn't compare. It's so much greater than what they feel about them changing themselves. Because I feel like I just save somebody's life, but also save their future. Like, they can see their kids, and their kids get to know who they are. And, like, it makes them a better person. And it almost makes me, like, want to cry because... That one makes me so upset because that's not, that's just not true. It's like, yeah, some of them are true. And you know what? The ones that are complete dicks at the gym or any fitness facility or anywhere you go in public, anywhere you go in public, a dick server, whatever it is, someone who's just a jerk, there's two things you got to think of. One, they could just be having a horrible day. Their mom could have died the day before the dog could have been woke up this morning and just didn't look well. And it's like, you got to give people the benefit of the doubt because we all have bad days. And two, they're just louder. <laughs> they're just louder. And humans just react to the more most aggressive, loud thing. It catches our attention. We're like little bunnies in a meadow. We just pop our heads up like meerkats coming out of the hole. We just like, we love noise. Hence why we're all addicted to Twitter and social media because we don't like time. We don't like anything that's slow. We don't like taking long walks. We like this craziness. Twitter, Twitter, Trump, Trump, China, China, North Korea, Russia, ah, lawyers, sue, impeach. We just love, we're like constantly on it, on edge. It's like the whole nation just popped in Adderall, like all the Adderall, like every day. Um, but yeah, and that's the family one's hard. It's really hard. You know, you got time, family support, friend support, and then you have uh, intimidation factors. It's not easy. Um, then you have like bad experiences. Some people may have had, had tried to work out before and they had a bad experience. And you know, if you hurt yourself and you only, only thing that changed during your day, if everything was the same thing, the only thing that was adjusted is you worked out. Yeah, I could totally get it. And it's like, I get it. I understand, but I, 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 it helped me so much. I know it can help a lot of people, but it's whatever I, I, you can do the same thing with paint and art and wood and whatever, doing wood, you know, carpentry, whatever you do. I just, I truly believe that in order for you to change your life and to get rid of whatever that vice is, or at least minimize it to a controlling manner, you have to take that energy that you invest into whatever that vice is, whatever it is. And you have to take that energy and figure out a way to like scoop it out, extract it out of there, suck it out of there, and just kind of throw it to different things, throw it to school. That's why I got back in school because I I wanted to learn. (laughs) You know, throw it into school, throw it into maybe a few new friendships or to test, test some friendships out, try to become a better person, you know, throw, throw some energy into developing a better bond with your parents, especially your father and your mother, you know, throw it into the weight room and just take that energy and just, just, just fade it out, you know, just, just, you know, put it out. You have one chance at this world and it's like, you're not going to do wrong. Like I was talking to my girlfriend, she was having like a panic attack about chemistry, which she ended up pretty much getting A's in both. And, um, it was like, you are having a panic attack right now because you have, let's say you have a hundred pennies, you put a hundred pennies on chemistry and you think that this is what your life is going to be. You think this is all you have. You think this is the only thing that you benefit from because it's the one thing that only you can validate, validate for yourself. Everybody else can validate you, but that doesn't mean anything because you don't, if they're already agreeing with you, you're not going to agree with them again. And it's like chemistry makes you different. It not not even makes you different. That's not that's not what I'm trying to say. But it it makes you. It gives you a bigger sense of meaning besides just being smart. Or if you can do chemistry, it's a different thing. It's like I could do chemistry. You know, it's like the same people we know who can like do you know do backflips. Like I could do backflips. And it's like I broke it down. It's like you that's you put all your hundred pennies in that. Now let's act like there's a hundred you know eight billion pennies which are individual people, 
And let's say you could take the top five things that those people enjoy about their life and that they find a passionate. If you go one, two, three, four, five in order, I bet I would put money on it that nobody has a top five same thing that they like, which means that we all have a hierarchy of priorities. But if your hierarchy, your number one priority on that on the, the, at the top of the hierarchy is has a huge gap between number one and number two, you run into an issue because then nothing fulfills you. And then once that falls a little bit, you just feel like everything goes. And then the floodgates open, the water just comes through, the, tr- the tsunami hits, the tornado hits, the earthquake, the volcano, and you just go and then you hit the shitter. And that's why I think it's so important to find the ability to take control of your life. And whether it be a weight, like for me, and that's why I was very open. I told you guys about it. It's like, I mean, I, I was two, sh- two, two shirt Mike, you know, always had two shirts on. Because it one, it made me look skinnier, which it doesn't. If you're overweight and you're struggling with this, it doesn't make you look skinnier. It makes you look bigger. Well, I had like a cotton one on. If you can get like a tighter one, I bet it, <laughs> I bet it would help a little bit more. But for me, I had like some pains. So, so the reason one is because I thought it was, made me look skinnier. And reason two, it made me sweat less. But I had a real thick like Hanes, uh, Fruit of the Loom, one of those companies, hundred percent like cotton, so it actually made me sweat less, and it puffed out, so it made me look bigger. <laughs> so it both of those went wrong. But, you know, it comes to a point where you just have to make the decision, and it's like you either won't make the decision, which a lot of people don't, or you will make the decision. And if you know somebody who's struggling with something, which we all do, it's like you have to just be there for them and let them know that your hand is over the cliff, is right on the edge of the cliff whenever they need to grab it. You know, whenever they need to grab. And every once in a while, you got to swoop down and just make sure they don't go off the cliff and let go of the rock, let go of the root that's holding them up. But just let them know that your hand's there because they're on the cliff and they're not going to change. The only way they're changing is if they grab, if, if, they, if they decide to grab your hand. You know, you can't force them up. If you force them up, they're letting go. They're gone. But it's like, and that's a serious, I, I mean that seriously. You have to just be there for people. You have to let them know that you're there. You got to let them know that you're there, that your hand's ready for them to pull it up. They can have 100 hands out, and that doesn't give them 100, 100 chances, 100 times higher chance to get through whatever they're going through, but it does give them 100 different hands to grab. 100 different hands to grab. They could still never make that decision, never come around, and then nobody's hand's getting grabbed, but you got to just keep your arm out there, and you can change someone's life. You can change your life, and it benefits you so much more than I think it benefits them. I mean that. I really do mean that. Um, yeah. It's important to me. It really is important to me that you guys hear that and you guys listen and understand that. Um, but I'm going to pro- I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna go ahead and shut this podcast down now, guys. Um, I'm going to go work on some carpentry because it's one of the passion projects I have been getting into. Fun. This table right here is going to go. I'm, I'm working on a new one. I, I think driftwood might be getting tossed. I'm not 100% sure. You guys see there's more lighting in here. I have another light right there. Got a light right there. Got my mic right here. New one still hasn't shipped out yet. Got a new software. I got a Final Cut Pro. Which was like $199.99 with like a student discount. Which they never had any like information to prove that I was a student. So if you guys want to take advantage of that, just act like you're a student. Just like type in like Final Cut Pro uh, student package. So I got that. So everything's going to be going a lot smoother. Um, but yeah, guys, this is it. This is the podcast. This is going to be the end of episode four. If you guys enjoyed it, please leave a like, comment, subscribe, share the video on YouTube with people that you know. Um, if you guys listen to this on any of the major platforms of podcast outlets, please leave it a rating. Please leave it a like. Please leave it a rating stars whatever whatever the rating process is please leave a positive one if you guys have any negative ones please uh, put it there too and just let me know what i can fix and obviously the more and more we do this the better we're going to get at it and we're going to have different guests on sooner than later i promise you i don't i'm not going to lie about that Um, but i do want a second mic in Um, other than that i'm probably going to do some phone calls uh the i have a roadcaster pro which you guys just Google that. If you guys want to start a podcast, I would recommend this. It makes life a lot easier. Um, it's a little bit harder if you do a video style, but with the Roadcaster Pro, you can just you 
you can do whatever. You can put four microphones on there. You can have four headsets. You can do Bluetooth, which I'm going to be taking advantage of. You can do USB cable. You can hook your iPhone up if you want to listen to music. Just so many different options. But um, yeah, let's uh, keep this keep this train rolling. Um, thank you guys. Hopefully, you guys enjoy this. I think this was actually episode five. So this is episode five. Uh, thank you guys so much. Have yourself a beautiful, beautiful day.